Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered, from live appearances to an online version, and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events, is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Walter Federowitz, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, I would like to welcome you to the final session of our 2020 festival, Rebirth Charleston, which is being presented live from the stage of the Martha and John M. Rivers Performance Hall at the Gilliard Center. Let me begin by stating the obvious. 2020 has been a year that has tested all of us, wherever we are and whatever we do. And while I would in no way equate the impact of COVID-19 on a literary festival with the suffering, death, and devastation experienced by far too many segments of our society, we were no different than most cultural institutions, and that the pandemic meant that we at Charleston to Charleston could not and should not conduct business as usual this year. We were left with only two realistic options, no festival for 2020 or a reimagined festival. We chose the latter. So rather than holding live events with in-person audiences in Charleston, as we had in prior years, for 2020, we decided to become Zoomers and to stream our events over the internet to a virtual worldwide audience. While this solution is not ideal and has its own challenges, we have worked hard to retain the essence of what makes our festival special so that when COVID-19 is in the rearview mirror, we will be able to use what we have learned in 2020 to make us a stronger, more resilient organization. For example, one notable silver lining for this year is that we've been able to expand our reach well beyond the low country and have had the largest attendance in our history with more than 7,000 registrants from all over the world for this year's event. Obviously, we were not alone in having our world turned upside down because of the pandemic. This afternoon, our distinguished panel will examine how COVID-19 and its fallout has had a deep and profound effect upon our local cultural community. This is not measured solely by canceled performances, lost income and plummeting endowments, but also by the personal toll to artists and musicians and those who nurture and sustain us by their work in concert halls, bookstores, galleries and cinemas. Our panelists will speak to those issues. Perhaps more importantly, our speakers today will also share with you their thoughts about what our cultural landscape might look like once we emerge from our current crisis. Perhaps this landscape will look dramatically different than it did in the pre-COVID era, but is it possible that we will emerge from this dark period with a stronger, even more vibrant cultural community in Charleston? In a moment, I will turn the proceedings over to Maura Hogan, who is to my left, arts critic at the Post and Courier, who will chair the program and introduce our other panelists. Before doing so, I would like to thank a few people who have made today's event possible. 
First of all, I would like to thank our board of directors for their willingness to embrace an entirely new model for this year's festival, a fully virtual festival for which all events would be presented free of charge. Also, I would be remiss if, it, if I did not thank our small but amazing team of Leah Ryan, Diana Reich, and Suzanne Pollock for making it all happen. Next, I would like to thank the Charleston Gilliard Center and the Gilliard Performance Hall Foundation for their generous support and for allowing us to present today's program from the beautiful Martha and John M. Rivers Performance Hall. I've asked Renee Anderson, President and CEO of the Foundation and a friend to say a few words on behalf of the Gilliard. Renee. Thank you, Walter, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the conversation. Um, I am Renee Anderson, and I am privileged today to be able to welcome you on behalf of the Charleston Gilliard Center, your Gilliard Center, and its board uh, of directors, the Gilliard Management Corporation, as well as our foundation, the Gilliard Performance Hall Foundation. Our chair is Martha Rivers Ingram, who, with Joseph P. Riley, uh, 10 years ago, or 12, uh, when Joe was still mayor, uh, got together and decided that they would put, put their trust in each other and create, recreate a Gilliard um, Center to, create, to give a cultural asset, a beautiful cultural asset to this community, their hometown, both Joe Riley and Martha Ingram's hometown. Um, moreover, um, they decided that we would find a way to create a performance hall that was acoustically superior in every way so that the Charleston Symphony and Spoleto Festival USA would have the best platform and the best stage to delight audiences for 100, 200 years to come. Also by design, they decided that indeed this performance hall would be created to become the community's largest classroom for the children of the low country. And we are ever proud to have those school children in our hall and look forward to a post COVID time when they can return. It is our incredible pleasure to partner with the Charleston Gilliard, with the Charleston Literary Festival, because the programming that they are bringing to us cultural and arts, visual arts and performing arts is really the kind of world-class programming that Martha Ingram and Mayor Riley wanted for our community when this building was envisioned. And Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival has done just that for us this 2020 season. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Today's event could not have taken place without the generous financial support by Tom Taft. I've asked Tom to say a few words about why he thought it was important to support this event. Tom. Thank you, Walter and Renee. You honor me by the opportunity to describe my interest in the Charleston, the Charleston Literary Festival. I believe deeply in the power of the written word describing and interpreting history, politics, science, depicting love, uh, culture, justice, injustice, passion, the arts, and poetry for the joy that it gives us. Said differently, the human condition. This literary festival is to the literary arts what Spoleto is to the performing arts. And I like to think of the literary festival as being one of the two bookends of culture in Charleston. I want to thank all of you for being with us tonight, and I want to thank the other sponsors of the Literary Festival for giving their support and to ask all of you to think in terms of giving us your financial support. Thank you for being with us tonight. Hi, my name is Leah Ryan, and I'm the festival director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. And you've just heard a whole bunch of thank yous and even thank yous for my very small team that makes this festival happen, but I couldn't let the afternoon go by without making one more. Walter Federowitz is the president of our little team 
And at every turn, he is there. He is the heart of our organization, and none of us would be here without him. So thank you, Walter. We couldn't do it without you. And now, I present an amazing session led by Maura Hogan. Thank you, Leah. Welcome to the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival's <coughs> final event, Rebirth Charleston. We're back home here in Charleston, and I am Mara Hogan, arts critic at the Post and Courier in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, first, I thought I'd give you a little background from Charleston for those of you who may not be aware. Um, Charleston this year commemorates the 350th anniversary of its founding. Over that 3.5 centuries, uh, this port city has championed the arts. They have viewed them as a point of pride and a calling card. 2020, therefore, was set to be a particularly vital and diverse year for this self-avowed arts hub. For instance, it boasted a gleaming state of the arts performance hall in the, Char the <coughs> Charleston Gilliard Center one that still has that glorious new car smell. In this hall, Charleston Symphony, the city's world-class, internationally powered orchestra, regularly sounds Charleston's artistic excellence. The International Arts Festival, Spoleto Festival USA, each year for decades, has brought here and to other venues in Charleston the world to our city's door. Around town, a dynamic, Contemporary music scene um, has earned a new feather in its cap of late when the gullah-powered band Ranky Tanky came home in 2020 with a Grammy Award. The visual arts scene was equally vibrant with a recent renovation of the Gibbs Museum of Art, plus countless other venues and galleries powering right along. There were also dozens of theater companies and dance companies, arts and education programs, and literary and performing arts festivals. March, of course, brought all this to a full stop. In this very room, Ranky Tanky and Charleston Symphony performed together in a pack crowd, to a packed crowd before the hall closed its doors, only recently reopening to a limited capacity. It has been nothing short of devastating for the local arts community, from the gig economy to the multi-million dollar initiatives. So how can Charleston now regroup and recalibrate to recapture this previous momentum? How can we emerge from the pandemic and a paradigm shift from Black Lives Matter to again put forth arts reflective of this city? To explore this, Charleston to Charleston has gathered five of Charleston's leading cultural figures. And I will uh, introduce each one of them now to you. Uh, first is Martha Rivers Ingram. She's a business executor, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and patron of the arts, who counts among her many accomplishments, her leadership in transformative projects, including the Skirmerhorn Symphony Center in Nashville and the Charleston Gilliard Center. South Carolina artist Jonathan Green, who is widely regarded as the most important, one of the most important painters of the Southern experience. He serves as ambassador for the arts for the city of Charleston and is co-chair of the Charleston 350 commemoration. Ken Lamb, music director of the Charleston Symphony since 2015, who also holds posts of music director of the Illinois Symphony Orchestra, resident conductor of the Brevard Music Center, artistic director of Hong Kong Voices, and conductor laureate of the Baltimore Symphony Youth Orchestra. Maestro Lam first came to Charleston in 2002 when he directed the opera Fen Ti Ying at Spoleto Festival USA. Grammy Award winning Charlton Singleton, who was co-founder and past music director of Charleston Jazz Orchestra, founding member of Ranky Tanky, and artist in residence emeritus at Charleston Gilliard Center. Nigel Redden, our man from Oz here on Zoom, uh, who is general director of Spoleto Festival USA and has been a major contributor to Charleston's cultural renaissance during his 35-year affiliation with Spoleto. To start, each of these participants will share insights on the current status, challenges, and opportunities, and the path forward. 
Now we've picked them in random order, uh, not alphabetical or anything like that. So I'm going to start with Ken Lamb, who's going to share his insights. Thank you, Mara. Um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what has happened with the uh, symphony orchestra, um, especially the Charleston Symphony. Um, in March this year, mid-March, uh, we, like most other orchestras in the US, um, canceled the remaining of concerts of the season. Um, since then, except for one live-streamed concert in response to Black Lives Matter movement, we have not had any concerts with the full orchestra until two weeks ago. Now, personally, I, I think I speak for most conductors. This is probably the longest time we have been not working uh, over eight months. Uh, what this means is that orchestral musicians have not been able to work in the normal way, which is in-person live performances. Venues are closed across the country, and some states have put into place limits on gatherings, which means we just could not get together. It is particularly difficult for symphony orchestras to function. Wind and brass players cannot play their instruments with masks on, and singing in a large chorus is just way too risky. Hardest hit of all are the freelance musicians. Many have been without work or income since March, and many have taken up other employment, and some may never return to music. Faced with these unprecedented challenges, many orchestras across the country cancel the seasons, some have furloughed their musicians, and I know some orchestras have actually shut down completely. The Charleston Symphony's board met with all of our staff and musicians back in March, and we decided to try our best to keep going. At that time, we have already launched our 2021 season, a season that focuses on the 250th anniversary of Beethoven and the centenary of women's right to vote. By mid-March, we have already sold many subscriptions to, um, so the incentive is there for us to keep performing because we don't want to disappoint our audiences and we also know that cancellation will mean that we'll have to refund all the subscription monies that we've collected. So we got to work. We got up to speed with and, it, in, and invested in technology to keep engaging our audiences. Instead of full symphonic concerts, our musicians performed live living room concerts through Zoom. We made lots of music videos and distributed them on social media to entertain our patrons. We had virtual coffees and talks with our donors. Our Charleston Symphony Orchestra League even managed to host a sold out fundraising golf day in early October. On the education front, we partnered, we partnered with Midtown theater and produce online materials for teachers and students across the Tri-County. And we work with the Satilli Theater to ensure that our youth orchestra has a place to rehearse when we, are we, can, when we can do so safely. To ensure that we have a 2021 season, over the summer we build the Charleston Symphony Virtual Concert Hall, our digital platform for streaming performances. We strengthened our relationship with the Gilead Center, our critical partner in presenting concerts safely. We forged new partnerships, notably with Roper over the summer and with MUSC beginning this fall, with health and safety planning that included COVID testing for all of our musicians before rehearsals begin. All this culminated in our returning to the Gilead Center and this very stage, actually, two weeks ago for our first in-person performance of the season. We welcomed a limited audience over three concerts, and I've never been happier and more excited about performing with a group of incredibly dedicated people. While we know the challenges are far from over, we are persevering 
And we know that our patrons miss the arts, they miss coming to concerts, live in-person performances are experiences that are not replaceable. In the end, I believe our flexibility, creativity and determination from all of us, our staff, board, musicians, guest artists, and yes, from our loyal patrons too, knowing that we're in this together will help keep us and get us through this really tough period. I also know that many of the innovations that we, we have invested in and the partnerships that we've formed and strengthened will continue after the, this pandemic is over. In many ways, I think the pandemic has brought our arts community together much more urgently than before. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. You know, I was interested in, in that innovation, that so much of the innovation that has happened during the pandemic has been by necessity. And with that, have you had any eureka moments of, well, this works, and I think we'll move forward with that, whether it's technology or anything of that nature? Absolutely. I think the technology, uh, it's it played, played of a, a key part. Um, with the live streaming, we're able to even beyond the pan pandemic to reach more and more people. We offer patrons who may not be able to come to the concert hall physically uh, 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 another way to continue to engage with the symphony. And I think what's really important also is we, we, we understand how critical our partnerships um, with the Gilead Center, for instance, how critical that is. And Actually, it has brought all of us closer together, which, you know, it, it, success for us means success for the Gilead Center and vice versa. So, and all of the work that we've put into with all the streaming and all the flexibility in, uh, you know, just helping each other. And I think that is not going to change. I think we have sort of learned new ways to be there for each other. And I think that is crucial for the success of the arts going forward. Absolutely. Okay, now I think we'll move on to Nigel um, to, to hear what he has to say about this very tumultuous year for Spoleto Festival USA. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me be part of this panel. Uh, it was interesting to hear what Ken had to say. Uh, I, I've certainly realized that orchestras have had a more difficult time in some ways than festivals. We had to cancel the 2021 festival, which was extraordinarily painful. Uh, we were able to uh, fortunately pay many of the artists who were planning to come, but I mean, th that was small recompense for the, the kind of uh, emotional energy that they had put into preparing for performances. Uh, we had to postpone, we, we hoped that we were going to postpone much of what we had planned for 2020 into 2021. Uh, that now is something that we will have to re-examine as uh, the conditions uh, evolve. Uh, but I, it, it's particularly good to talk about uh, our plans in light of the Charleston to Charleston Festival because the the highlight of the 2020 festival was in fact inspired by a book, inspired by the autobiography of Omar ibn Said, uh, which uh, Omar ibn Said wrote in 1831. Uh, we uh, were able to read this uh, manuscript, read this autobiography, which was written in Arabic because of the wonderful translation that Ala al Rais had, had done uh, in his uh, book called The Story of a, a Muslim Slave. Uh, but the, the story of Omar was one that is very much a Charleston story, a, a story of a man who was taken out of his, his home in Africa at the age of 37, uh, transported to Charleston, uh, sold in Charleston, and um, uh, then fled from his first master, uh, fled to North Carolina where he was captured and sold again, uh, and lived with these new masters until he died in 1863 at the age of probably about 93. But he wrote this uh, autobiography in uh, 1831, which is a very moving story of a 
man whose life took an extraordinarily unexpected turn. Uh, uh, this story has been put to music by uh, Rhiannon Giddens and Michael Abels. Rhiannon also did the uh, autobiography, the uh, libretto, which is a extraordinarily moving look at what that life must have been like and what life must have been like for for people who were taken like he was. I mean, the 6 million, 10 million, 12 million people who suffered through the Middle Passage. But we, it was extraordinarily painful not to be able to uh, bring that to the stage in uh, 2020. And now we're planning to do it in 2021, uh, along with many other aspects of the program that we had um, planned for 2020. However, we are also planning a lot of protocols to make the process safe for artists, for technicians, for staff around the theater, and of course, for audiences. Uh, we are expecting to have a much smaller audience than um, we would have had otherwise, uh, simply because of social distancing and so on. And I, I have to say that in hearing Ken speak about what the Charleston Symphony had done, I, I think that it's wonderful that so many things are streamed and so much music has been made available to people in their homes. However, I don't think anything matches a live performance. Uh, I've been able to go to two live performances in the last six months, eight months. And the first one I went to, I was actually reduced to tears because it was so magic to see a live performance again, to see dancers on a stage. Uh, this was outdoors. We were all very socially distant. And the, there were only uh, duets and solos because the, the, the dancers were in pods. Uh, they're in bubbles that uh, you know, preserved their, their health. But it was so wonderful to see something live again. And uh, the second performance I, I went to, again, we were all 11 feet um, distant from one from another, but it was, again, seeing a person being able to feel an audience was remarkable. However, um, we, I think, have to make the best of the situations that we're in. And one of the uh, advantages or one of the silver linings of uh, the situation that we're in is that we have, in fact, tried to uh, reach our audiences uh, in, in different ways. Uh, rather than doing performances, we've uh, done a series of, of talks to try to expand on what people will see on stage. So, for example, last week we had, uh, well, yes, last week, on Tuesday, we had uh, the second in our series called Exploring Omar. And uh, this was a, a talk about Senegal and the Low Country. Senegal, of course, having a, uh, a very close connection uh, with the Low Country because so many of uh, the Africans who were enslaved in, in uh, the Low Country came from Senegambia. Uh, but it was fascinating to hear someone in Senegal talking about uh, the ways in which he felt the various languages in, in Senegal had uh, uh, influenced uh, uh, English spoken in the Low Country. I mean, he made quite a few examples, but also to hear about the, the, the history that was happening in the late uh, 18th and early 19th century in Africa that then um, that, that was part of, of, of the slave trade and how uh, Omar himself was captured. But we will. Oh, uh, Nigel, I was just wondering, you know, regarding Omar, um, have, since it was, I think, well underway, I would assume, before um, the festival was canceled, has this pandemic pause, um, particularly with paradigm shifts like Black Lives Matter, has any of that affected Omar or any of the other programming? that you had set and that you are um, moving towards the next season? Absolutely. And it, I'm not actually sure how it will impact Omar. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the director, Charlotte Brathwaite, 
wants to reconceive the opera, which we have moved from the Philly to the Villiard to provide more space, the orchestra more space for um, audiences and more space for the performers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually had a conversation last week about the reconception of exactly how that will work. There are other things that we can do. In some ways, I mean, Black Lives Matter, I think, has been a kind of extraordinary movement. It, it certainly has um, encouraged us as later to look at ourselves, uh, look at how we operate, also to look at very much what we're going to say. And while this was not you know, the, the decoration day, which is one of the, uh, the Charleston events that we want to explore in, in 2021, uh, is Decoration Day was not brought to our attention by through Black Lives Matter. It was, it was actually Denmark Festival's Garden, which I think uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, what um, I what um, what what it has done is made us think of these things in different ways. Think of the history of Charleston in a different way. I mean, Charleston, well, looking at today's Post and Courier, I mean, the the, um, the the history that was outlined, or not outlined, was examined uh, really quite wonderfully on the page of the Post and Courier this morning, uh, I think gives us a sense of that history of Charleston that we don't know. I mean, Charleston is a uh, uh, city of memory, but it's a city of selective memory. And some memories are more prominent than others. And I think that now's the time when we can shift some of those memories and think about other memories that somehow should be perhaps front and center at this point. So we are hoping that, that the Toledo Festival in 2021 will be a somewhat different festival than simply the postponement of, of the festival that happened in 2020. Okay. Only well, let's move on to Jonathan. Well, hello. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here in the hall again. It's been some time. I must say, as an elder artist, this has been one of the greatest moments of my life. Uh, 30 years of having been able to uh, work in the studio continuously to be able to finish lots of projects and also this is a great moment for me in terms of it being a moment of inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, as an African-American artist I can remember in the 70s when there were no images of African-American art in most museums or in most galleries. So this is a great opportunity for us to reflect on history and culture and not only to see it from the perspective of his or her history as in Euroculture, but looking at the abundance of world culture and how Charleston has been shaped. If a city is deemed the holy city, then it is obviously a city for all people. And I think this is a great opportunity, moment in time, for us to reflect on the togetherness of what we can do as a people and to remember that no matter what we do today, it should be for tomorrow. So we should be uh, taking seriously the education of kids, which we are doing at the Gibbs Museum with Vibrant Visions, which is a really difficult uh, 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 place and time in that so many African Americans are not very comfortable with going into museums for obvious reasons. But with this show, Vibrant Visions, it is a show about the WPA, which was our American Renaissance. It was the first time for African Americans to be able to title their paintings and paint depictions of themselves. It was certainly the first time that women were able to sign and to be noted as artists. And we are still enjoying the many multitudes of the WPA period from uh, President Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt. So in the collection, we have 49 pieces that are selected out of 13 pieces. And these are your, this is from your personal co collection. Your, as, yours as in Jonathan Green and Richard Wheatman can't leave him out. That's right. right. And, <laughs> and you might want to also talk about how the pandemic kind of pushed this collection forward. Well, the, the, a portion of the collection was first shown at the Gibbs Museum in 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that period, Angela, mm -hmm great person, innovative thinker. She had been thinking a long time ago, how are we going to increase the awareness of this museum publicly? How are we going to increase it visually that is more inclusive of everyone? And I must say the Gibbs Museum's manifesto is probably one of the finest written in America today because it actually addresses the issue of 
enslavement and it apologizes for it in an art museum. That's really where it should happen. The, in, the collection includes about, oh, maybe 30 artists, uh, only one Euro artist, and that is Milton Avery, only because he has an image of a, of, of a bird that's similar to Jimmy Lee Suttoth. But these are people that were not allowed to paint their own images until the WPA mm -hmm. in the middle 30s. Women were not allowed to be in museums accepted and appreciated as artists in museums. So this is a groundbreaking show and it just happens to be that an artist and an art collector are the people that 44 years ago decided that with my being a student at the Art Institute of Chicago, and also working as a security guard and learning so much about history and culture as a security guard, that <laughs> this was an important time yeah. in our lives, certainly for me. I could have never imagined uh, being here at this place in time with my art, with the success of my art, being able to paint continuously during this epidemic and to realize that with all the work that I'm doing, it is for a purpose. And the purpose for me personally are our children. They are the most valuable customers. Absolutely. And my understanding is, is that, that the collection was in process, but that because of the pandemic, it was pushed forward. Uh, Black Lives Matter emerged. So that was happenstance in terms of the collection going underway. But what a wonderful gift to Charleston that actually lives in Charleston to have this type of collection during the pandemic and be able to avail of it you know, in a socially distanced way right now. Yes, that collection along with the uh, children's book on Robert Smalls, mm -hmm. uh, that is at the City Gallery, uh, your husband, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> created a magnificent show from a children's book on the life of Robert Smalls. I just, I just gave a talk yesterday for the University of South Carolina and I was asked to speak on the uh, Barbados-Charleston connection. And in realizing from reading, <clears throat> The most incredible, poignant moment is that of Busa. And Busa was an enslaved uh, 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 African in Barbados, and he was able to lead over 20,000 people to stand up for their freedoms and their rights. Unfortunately, he was killed during the event. Mm -hmm. But you have Busa on one end from 1818 to Robert Smalls in 1865, and there are no great monuments to Robert Smalls in this country, with the exception of one in my family church, a bust of Robert Smalls in the Tabernacle Church. And then there's a piece in the uh, uh, museum, in Wa the, the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. Just think, we would not be on this stage if it wasn't for Robert Smalls. Mm -hmm. We would not even be socializing with, with each other if it wasn't for Robert Smalls. So I say, rather than dealing with you know, the overtness of removing statues regardless of its place in history, why don't we just add? I think it's, it's far more positive to be inclusive. And there are not the monuments in this country, uh, certainly in Charleston with the exception of the architecture and the building of the plantations by African people, that speaks on the most important history and culture of West African. It's just not readily available. And I think with this, this, this moment in history where we're sort of frozen, I think we owe it to ourselves to give credit to the arts and culture of Charleston for its originality. Mm -hmm. And I think much of that starts with the inclusion of West African, European, Asian, and Native American cultures. Well, that is a perfect segue to Charlton, mm. his celebration of Gola and Ranky Tanky. So why don't you take it? Um, thank you, Maura. Um, much like um, what has been said already, um, and especially with, uh, with Ken and, and a lot of the musicians uh, who are uh, some very good friends of mine um, from the Charleston Symphony Orchestra, um, it has been quite a, a tough time for us as, as uh, performing um, musicians that rely on touring. Um, and um, of course with touring that, um, that relies on audience, audiences and, and, um, and venues and places to play. And um, um, being on the stage with the Charleston Symphony Orchestra when we literally were, uh, w honestly we were backstage wondering if we were going to actually go through with the show. 
I was wondering yeah. too. <laughs> and um, it, was, uh, it was a special moment um, for us to, um, to play with our home symphony and, um, and play with our friends and, and, uh, and celebrate um, this great award that we had just gotten. Um, we were all so very emotionally uh, high and full of adrenaline and everything um, from being you know, awarded a Grammy. That's something that I think every musician probably has their hopes you know, up to, to, to get that achievement. Um, and uh, to set a schedule for the remainder of the year to to go out to the world uh, like we had been doing, but having this this uh, this grand honor and um, and to spread all of the love and all of the uh, the knowledge that and and um, and all of the the village and family love that we received and that we know of from the Low Country throughout the world. Um, to have all of that come to a halt uh, was quite traumatic. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, but at the same time, uh, like we said before, through technology and, um, and being artists that we are um, and our creativity um, starts to come through on how to get our, um, our art form, whether it is uh, music or theater or visual art, um, to use that technology in order to keep going. Um, uh, sometimes it's, um, you know, it's hard to, uh, to, to, to think about not being in front of that audience and getting that, that adrenaline, that rush that you, that you love and you live for when you're playing. Uh, but at the same time, when you get now that message through technology, whether it's an email or if it's a, a comment on something that said, hey, I needed that today. <coughs> I needed that little, that little sonata that you played or that little jazz song that you played. Um, that has been just as, um, just as important in this time for a lot of people to get through these times that we have been, um, that we uh, all find ourselves in. Um, as of late, um, as we have all been um, adjusting and trying to um, figure things out and be creative um, with, um, with venues such as uh, this great facility in the, in the Gilliard Center uh, reopening and uh, other uh, concert promoters and, and festivals and, and, um, and things are starting to figure things out and find ways to socially distance their patrons. Um, we have started to turn the page a little on the touring side and look towards 2021 a lot more. And in some instances, we've been able to, um, to actually go to a venue or outdoors and play. Um, and that has been exciting. Um, it has um, it certainly lit a fire um, uh, within all of us. Uh, and so um, we are definitely looking forward to um, things to come. Terrific. And have you found any sort of happy accidents? Because, for instance, with Ranky Tank, you had the first album, you had the second album. Have you found that you've been able to reach different audiences with technology than you have tried to or anything of that nature? Absolutely. Um, when you, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different audience when you can stream and, um, and when you can get um, a friend to share mm -hmm. and hopefully that friend shares and, and it passes on. And so you do gain new, um, new support and, um, and uh, you engage a lot more people. Um, I remember when, when Ken was, was speaking and he used that word and I was like, exactly. The, the fact that we're able to still um, engage with our, our current fans or, or patrons and, 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 and supporters um, and uh, they in turn have been using their um, technology in order to um, you know, introduce us to their family and friends. So that has been a very big positive for and, us. And that will remain. I mean, and that will, will remain. continue to have that new base of audience. Absolutely. And, you know, I would imagine that um, Charleston Symphony has had that same experience. Absolutely, yeah. and one thing, uh, just to pick up on what Charleston was saying, a lot of our audience, some of them are not yet 
before the pandemic hit, w they were not yet very adept with exactly. technology. Yes. They are made to. <laughs> right. So, so, it, 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 so it's from all sides. Mm -hmm. So and that's why I think going forward, we have more right. opportunities that way. Okay. Now that moves us to Martha, who has been so instrumental yes. in these grand halls yes. that will again be full. Um, but I would love to hear your experience over the past few months. Laura, thank you. It's, um, I think I maybe I'm here as a patron, and that always seems to have to do with money and <laughs> fundraising. So maybe I'll speak a little bit about that because Absolutely. I'm not an artist, never have been, but I, that, it doesn't mean I don't love art. It just means, you know, I, I'm better at raising money than <laughs> trying to uh, do anything on the stage. It's uh, been interesting because I'm spending a great deal of time, speaking of technology, on my computer on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing that with four different uh, cities, places where I spend a fair amount of time during a given year. I, I grew up in Charleston, and I love Charleston, and I do have a home here, but I also have a home in Nashville which is where I live most of the time. And then I vacation some in the cold weather in Florida and some in the hot weather in the mountains. But in all of these places, I've become involved with the philanthropic side of running the arts activities in these various places. So I would say, first of all, that if I have any sway in any of these places, I have been beating the drum for the people who are the donors to continue doing what they've been doing all mm -hmm. along. Just because they've had to close down doesn't mean they don't have a staff that has to eat and pay rent and pay mortgages. And exactly. I said, you know, this is just, a, it, it doesn't have to be the full staff, but you've got to keep your key people. And I will continue giving what I've been giving. And you must preach this to all the other people and some will do it. Some, will, of course, they won't if they don't think there's enough going on. But I think that what I'm hearing as I talk on these Zoom calls is that these arts groups have been absolutely amazed at the, the positive feedback they're getting in dollars mm -hmm. because these people also, I mean, and many of them have been hit with the pandemic too, but they are understanding that there are people behind the stage sets and they have all these other things, children to look after and so forth. So I think that that, I hope I've been a positive influence there and I, th I think I have, but I'm sure other people have thought of it too. But a, uh, a number of years ago, I became chairman of our symphony orchestra in Nashville and it was just after the 1987 crash, financial crash. And the board panicked, and I was part of the board, so I must say I panicked too. But I learned from it. We shut down everything, furloughed all the musicians. Everything was gone. I mean, it was not furloughed coming back. It was furloughed over. And then, you know, I decided I didn't want to live in a city that didn't have a symphony. So, and I was, all, I was also chairman of a defunct organization, which is certainly no fun. So we, we got it going, but it took nine months to get the people in place and the records had been disbanded. So it's just really crucial that the organizations understand that they've got to remind their donors that they're just more important right now through this gap than ever. And I think it's working. At the same time, I'm seeing some interesting things in, in Nashville, for instance, the Nutcracker is the ballet's major fundraiser because they, you know, they do 18 performances or so, and of course they're not able to do it because the, 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 the spatial seating, it just doesn't work, work out. So they've used their rehearsal studio, which is separate from the Performing Arts Center in Nashville, and they have filmed it, and they are making a big to-do. It's Nashville's Nutcracker, and they've got it all worked out and it's gonna be good to go. And the, it, it's a stopgap because, you know, I think it's, it's going to be free for everybody, but they've got major business supporters who are backing the cost and putting it on one of the, uh, the regular television stations in Nashville. 
So that's a you know, really positive thing. But then once they have that in the can, so to speak, they can use it for other purposes, education, or they can do it if they ever get caught in this in a bad situation again. So that's been very innovative because they're not doing it in the Performing Arts Center, they're doing it in their own studios and somehow they've arranged the complicated sets to work in this place as well. Another thing that is um, important in the fundraising for our Nashville Symphony is that uh, there's usually a Christmas ball, or it's a holiday ball, it's not specifically Christmas, but the second Saturday in December. And this year, of course, they can't even think about doing that, but what they're going to do is they have got, every year they give an award to one of the country music uh, individuals. It's called the Harmony Award because we like to have the harmony between the commercial music and the classical music. And, so they give an award every year, and this is now we've got some of the biggest names, whether it's Taylor Swift or whatever, some of the biggest names that you can imagine that live in Nashville that have gotten this award. And now this year, they're coming, they're, this is a different television station, but they're on the night of the ball, our former Harmony Award win winners are going to be on television. And everybody who's a patron who sends in money is going to have delivered a bottle of wine and whatever, according to which where you are on the financial list. And they think they think, and I'm on the board, so I, I hear this. They think they're going to raise as much money this year as they have done oh, in the wow. past because of this whole thing about we've got to have philanthropy to keep going so when we can burst forth, we're going to be able to do, to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is, these things are very important. Up in the mountains of North Carolina, there's a festival. It's called the uh, Highlands uh, Cashers uh, Music, Chamber Music Festival. They just had a new hall built in Cashers, which was going to be launched this last year. And of course, that's now not, last year, last year was not possible to happen, but it is going to be relaunched beginning this next August, hopefully. I mean, it, 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 it's to hold 300 people, so it's a, it's a community kind of gathering place. But they've made plans, they've got some super musicians coming in, and they're, they're you know, going to have it a rebirth, kind of like this. But all of these places, and the one down in Florida that I'm thinking of, in, in uh, Jupiter, Florida, they have a, a small a theater, it's professional theater, but they have done so well, they needed to enlarge it, and they were going to do it piecemeal over a number of years, and instead, they've appealed to their supporters, and they, they're doing it during the shutdown, and they're going to have a grand opening That's of this bigger, better theater beginning, um, not, not the, well, I think it's going to be the, in the fall. But, but it, so they, they worked around it, but I think the financials are going to be good in all these places. I don't see any of the groups that I'm involved with that I think are really threatened with permanent closure, even though right now, I mean, the Nashville Symphony has fur, furloughed over 100 people, <coughs> excuse me, including the, the staff. <coughs> but, but that is certainly, I mean, all along has been considered something temporary, not, not the closure that I went right. through back in the 80s. Well, and I mean, so. that's very heartening for two reasons. It's heartening, obviously, because we have this, you know, um, optimism about sustaining it, but it's also heartening because it's a testament to the power of the arts. And yeah. even when they're dark, uh, people are not stopping. And I, I know I've heard anecdotal stories from Spoleto and from Charleston Symphony of um, <clears throat> both organizations offering when the seasons or festivals were canceled, you know, you can you can have you know your subscription refunded. And you know, if I don't, am I correct, Ken and Nigel, that um, there was a wonderful demonstration of no turn it into um, donations? Yeah. Yes. Almost nobody asked for refunds. Yeah. I think that wow. that was just a. We, we have a very yeah. special community mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And that, was that your case, Nigel? We were very surprised. Well, we were very pleased with how many people 
contributed back the box art, the uh, the money they'd spent on tickets. Uh, a certain number of them put them on um, on hold for the the money on hold for future purchases. But either both the contributions and putting it on hold were very very important to us. Mm -hmm. oh, wonderful. We have one question I had just in terms of pragmatics. Um, was for all of um, the art supporters who are tuning in right now, I was wondering um, if anyone could identify two or three straightforward steps that arts lovers can take to vouchsafe the vitality of the arts moving forward. Um, Charles, maybe we'll, we'll start with you on that one. <laughs> um, wow. Um, to make sure that Vitality. Um, um, I mean, it could be anything from social media oh, to, as you yeah. talked about, just the simplest things that you can do. And your, of course, philanthropy is very important. Staying in touch, mm -hmm. um, asking around, and a lot of times, um, you know, being someone that grew up in church, mm -hmm. um, we would always hear. Um, um, we would always hear our elders and, and, and all of the, the, the ladies in, in, of, of church and they would say, you know, so-and-so wasn't here today. I need to go and check in on them. And the fact that, you know, I'm not hearing from my, my favorite, you know, I, I need to check up on my, my, my orchestra. I need to check up on all of the things that I normally did that normally brought me joy because I need to make sure that that's in place selfishly that it's going to continue to bring me joy. Um, so social media um, is incredible. Um, it's hard to imagine how we, you know, survived without social media 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> You know, I was, I was joking the other day about how uh, I used to be in a band and we had a legal pad, much like you have right there, and we would basically go to uh, whatever performance we had and we would have everybody sign their name and give us their phone number. And every time we went back to that particular town, we would literally get on the phone and call all of these people. And that was the norm for us just in the late 90s, you know, or something like that. Social media. Um, um, uh, if it's a full group, um, th um, you know, trying to pass along uh, this full group to a friend or family that's just not, um, that's not aware. Um, Kiana and I, um, mm -hmm. Kiana is the lead singer in Ranky Tanky, um, and Kiana and I were talking just the other day about how um, we're blessed to uh, be in the position that we are, but on the flip side of that, there's still people in this town that have never heard of Ranky Tanky. And, um, and to turn you know, that on to somebody, mm -hmm. to introduce somebody to Jonathan's collection, to introduce somebody to mm -hmm. what the, the marvelous musicianship that comes from the, the orchestra, um, all of that is very important um, to, uh, to, to keep it going, especially with our young folks out there. Now's the time for our parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles to introduce you know, um, the Spoleto Festival, the, the, the collection and all of these things. Um, Spoleto was uh, the first time that I came into this hall um, as a kid was to see a Spoleto event. Um, the next time that I came into this hall was my father dragged me down here and I watched Dizzy Gillespie on the stage. Wow. I didn't know what I was listening to. I knew it was very interesting and it was very exciting, <laughs> but that was on this stage. Mm -hmm. And as a young person, when you get to be engaged into something like that, that carries on into their adulthood. We've Longevity. been we've been told we we can indulge in another ten minutes if that's okay oh, with everybody, um, because I think that is really interesting and and I think you know in terms of arts and education, changing culture in that way and I'm always trying on social media to say if you see something share it, you know give your own opinion of a concert you saw or and I my own sense is that it 